Hello, my name is Kay Edward Copeland, and I'm the pastor of New Zion Baptist Church in Rockford, Illinois. Today, we're going to take a look at the book of Colossians. And as we do so, I want you to remember that getting started right will help you cut it straight. Let's get started with context. What do we know about the context of the book of Colossians? Well, we know just from reading the book that Paul is writing from prison to a group of Christians that he has never met before. What does Paul have in common with these Colossian Christians? Well, according to chapter 1, verse 7, as well as chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, there's a man named Epaphras. Epaphras, apparently from Colossae, is a disciple who has had interaction with Paul. He's come to Rome to visit Paul or to minister to Paul, and somehow or another, in his interaction with Paul, he has described to, to Paul the cultural currents in the region of Colossae. And now Paul is writing the letter to address the toxic brew of various philosophies as well as traditional impulses that might threaten to derail this young church. Now, remember, Paul has had an extensive ministry in this region. We know that from Acts chapter 19, verse 10, where as Luke is describing Paul's ministry in Ephesus, he says in chapter 19, verse 10 of Acts, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul has invested a significant amount of time in this region, and the word has been broadcast throughout the region to such an extent that even in the book of Colossians, Paul lets us know that after the church at Colossae reads this letter, that they're supposed to get the letter from Laodicea that he sent there and vice versa. So Paul is concerned about the cultural currents in the region that he has spent a significant amount of time and energy. And this man Epaphras has described it in detail to him. And so now Paul is writing to this church he's never met to help them get solidly grounded in the preeminence and supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context. Now let's take a look at the structure of the book of Colossians. It's a short book, only four chapters, but has several moves that the chapter breaks don't necessarily align perfectly with the structural breaks, but they are helpful in the sense that there are just four or five major moves in the book. The first big section starts out after Paul gives his brief introduction. He goes into some prayer priorities as well as really the thesis of his letter, the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the next big section that really is in chapter two, we start seeing Paul addressing this toxic brew of cultural currents that might threaten to derail the faith of the Colossians. In the next big section that really starts in chapter three, he's gonna start drawing out the ethical implications as well as the practical applications of the gospel. And then by the time we get to chapter four, he's going to make a final prayer request and give some final instructions regarding his partners in ministry. So let's go back and take a look at this first big section that we find in chapter one. Chapter one, again, after a simple greeting, from verses three through eight, he lays out what he's thankful to God for in light of what Epaphras has told him about the church at Colossae, and then verses 9 through 14, he's going to lay out his prayer priorities for that same church. In verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1, he's describing the magnificence, the preeminence, the supremacy of Christ in poetic form, and he lays out uh, basically his thesis in the sense that verse 19 says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. We're going to see that theme unpacked throughout the rest of the book. And then in verses 21 through 23, he points out how 
that very same gospel that is centered in the preeminence of Jesus Christ, how it impacted these Colossians who were formerly alienated from God. And in verses 24, all the way up through chapter 2, verse 5, he's going to describe his ministry, his ministry not only to them, but how he struggles to make sure that everybody is complete in Christ and that they are rooted and grounded in the foundational truth of who Jesus is. In chapter 2, verse 6, all the way through the rest of that chapter, that is to the end of verse 23 in chapter 2, he's going to start addressing the things that he has heard from Epaphras that might upend the faith of the Colossians. And so he says things like in verse 8 of chapter 2, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. In verse 16 of chapter 2, he says, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. And then in verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. So we see just from these uh, admonitions, don't let anybody do this or do that or do this. He's addressing the things that have been brought to him as possible ways that the Christians and Colossians can be kidnapped by the cultural currents. In chapter 3, he then turns to the practical applications and implications of living in union with Christ. Now, very interesting when you take a look at it and how chapter 3 connects to chapter 2, because in chapter 2, Verse 12, he's said that we are unified with Christ. We're in union with him, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And then in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? So he's pointed out our mystical union with Christ in his death, in his burial, and now in chapter 3, he's going to talk about the resurrection life and how in the first part of that, this section, chapter 3, how we had to put off some things. That's verses 5 through 11, and then in verses 12 through 17, how we have to put on some things. And then the rest of that chapter, that is, that section, starting with chapter 3, verse 18, all the way up through chapter 4, verse 1, it's going to draw out some very specific practical implications as it relates to how we interact with the people we love, the family with which we live, as well as the people with which we labor. The end, the final section, Paul gives a simple prayer request and then lays out some final admonitions and some instructions as it relates to his partners in ministry. So that's the overall structure of the book of Colossians. Now let's take a look at some of the key themes. One of the themes that I don't want you to overlook is this theme of creation. We see it very prominently in the first chapter. Verse 15, for example, talks about how he's the firstborn of all creation. And verse 16 talks about how all things were created through and for him. Now we'll see this theme playing out even further as it relates to Christ being the image of God, the very image of the invisible God, according to verse 15, chapter 1. But he's also recreating us in that image. That's chapter 3, verse 10, recreating us in the very image. So that harkens back to the first few pages of the Bible, the whole creation account, how we were created in his image and how now this firstborn of all creation is recreating. He's making a new creation through the formation of these called out ones, named, namely his church. So creation and image, but also this theme of fruitfulness or fruit bearing. We see it, for example, in chapter 1, Verse 6, and how the gospel in the whole world is bearing fruit and 
increasing. Chapter 1, verse 10, how we are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. And chapter 2, verse 6, how we're supposed to be rooted and grounded. So this idea, again, sort of following along the lines of creation, but at the same time, a theme in and of itself of how the gospel inherently grows. It, it flourishes, and those who are impacted by the gospel ought to grow and flourish themselves. Another theme we see in the book of Colossians is this theme of fullness, that Christ being the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in bodily form, we see that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. That's chapter 1, verse 19, as well as chapter 2, verse 9. So this idea of fullness and how it ties into the idea of completeness uh, as well as maturity. So once again, since Christ, since there's nothing of God that's not in Christ, since he's the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in bodily form, the fullness of God, and if we're in him, we have the fullness of God. You see how that's working in Paul's argument against these other things, this toxic brew of traditionalism, of, of these other cultural currents like uh, philosophies and worshiping created things. If we have the fullness, we don't have to satisfy ourselves with substitutes that cannot satisfy. We have the real thing, the complete thing, the fullness of God. That's a theme that seems to be running through this book. Another theme that we see in this book is this idea of maturity or completeness. We see it, for example, in chapter 1, where Paul says in verse 28 that he preaches so as to warn everyone and teach everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature or complete in Christ. We also see it at the end of the book when Paul is talking about Epaphras and how Along with Paul, he's tag teaming to pray, to struggle in prayer, according to chapter 4, verse 12. Struggling on behalf of these Colossians in his prayers that you, they may stand mature and fully assured in all of the will of God. So at the beginning of the book and the, the end of the book, and in light of these other things and how they work together, Paul's primary concern is that they would be as complete in Christ as Christ is complete in God. I hope that you see how all of these themes work together to further Paul's argument, namely that if we have Christ, we have all sufficiency. And in Christ, we are to continue to grow until we reach full maturity. That's Paul's desire, that's his prayer, and that's his argument. And that's how those themes further that argument. Now let's take a look at how we can make some gospel connections in the book of Colossians. Now, obviously, as you read through the book, there are some things that just leap off the page at you. When we are in that middle section in chapter 2 where Paul is arguing against all of the cultural currents that threaten to kidnap the Colossians, he says very clearly in chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, that though we were dead in our trespasses, God has made us alive. He's counseled out the record of debts that stood against us by nailing it to the cross. Now, if you can't preach about the cross, you don't need to be watching this video. So some just jump out at you, but then there are others, like in the first big section, where Paul is talking about creation and Christ's reign and rule. Those are sort of bookends. The, the beginning, that God created us, and he had a mission and a plan, and that Jesus Christ, being the firstborn of all creation, and the one that all things were created through and for, that's an aspect of the gospel story, his creative power, and how that weaves into how we are to bear fruit and how Christ himself, the image of God, is making us into that very same image. He's renewing us, according to chapter 3, verse 10, into the very image of the one who created us. So you notice how Paul is taking a theme which actually is an aspect of the gospel, God's creative power, his redemptive plan. He ties it into some other themes like image, like 
bearing fruit like maturity. And if we will pay attention to those things, to the themes, when it comes time to make the gospel connection, we can find gospel connections that are multidimensional, that aren't flat. So, for example, when we look at chapter 3, he talks about being raised with Christ. He takes the aspect of the gospel known as the resurrection, and he, from that, pulls out the implications and the application. And so as we're preaching in chapter 3, we have to recognize that we have to tie it back to that aspect of the gospel, namely the resurrection. So Paul does a masterful job, and if we'll pay attention to him as we're making gospel connections through looking at the various aspects of the gospel that he is tying into and recognizing when he just articulates it very plainly and we can observe what he's doing, and the other times where underneath the surface, as he's arguing from a theme, that we can see how the gospel plays out according to his argument. In either case, what we're doing is recognizing that Paul has done a masterful job of weaving these themes together to present the gospel. And if we will make the connections, if we'll be sort of clear on what aspect of the gospel he's tying into, whether it be creation, whether it be Christ's current reign and the fact that he holds everything together and he's the firstborn of the church, whether it be the resurrection. And we can see not only the aspect, but how Paul is arguing from that aspect, then our gospel connection and our preaching will be much more robust and much more flavorful. These are some of the gospel connections that we see in the book of Colossians. Thank you for listening, and I hope that our time together has been fruitful for you. So as you prepare to teach or preach the book of Colossians, pay attention to all these things that we've gone over and allow the Holy Spirit to use you. And remember, getting started right will help you cut it straight. <laughs>